welcome to the Room EQ Wizard tutorial presented by GIK Acoustics. To download Room EQ Wizard, go to the website hometheatershack.com slash roomeq. Click on the downloads link at the top left. Now select the version that suits your operating system. This will bring you to a private page on the Home Theater Shack forum. If you're not registered yet, you'll need to do so to gain access to the download link. Once you're able to view the page after registering, scroll down a bit and click on the appropriate download link. From here, downloading and installing is self-explanatory. Now we can launch the program. This is the main interface of Room EQ Wizard. Before we get started, we need to set it up correctly, as well as hook up your microphone and calibrate your sound card. For testing purposes, you'll need an omnidirectional microphone with a flat frequency response. I've chosen to use the Behringer ECM-8000 condenser mic. The ECM-8000 is a favorite for working with room analyzers because it gets the job done very well, and most of all, it's inexpensive. Let's hook up the microphone as usual. Just make sure to turn on phantom power, as this is a condenser mic. We'll come back to the mic in a few, so for now let's take a look at how to calibrate your sound card. Calibrating your sound card or audio interface isn't that important, because with A-B testing, we're looking for a simple change in frequency response. However, it's probably a good idea to just get it out of the way while you're at it. When you're at the main interface of Room EQ Wizard, click on Preferences at the top and then Preferences again from the drop-down. At the top left, select your main output device. Also select your main input device and channel to the right. Before we calibrate, we need to create a loopback connection on your audio interface. This is simply using an audio cable with one end connected to an output channel with the other end connected at the input. This creates a direct loop for calibration and will eliminate your sound card's own frequency response, which makes for a more accurate test. Under Calibration, click the Calibrate button. You can get detailed instructions by reading under the Help section, but let's speed this process up to get you on your way. Just click Next. Once you've got the loopback connection made, click Next one more time to begin level calibration. A sine wave is now being sent to the selected output, and should be receiving on the input that you selected. You'll see the out meter sending the signal, and one of the inputs getting the same signal. You may have to adjust either the input gain or the output level on your interface to get them to match. Just make sure to get it as close as possible. Within 6 decibels or so should be good. Once the levels are satisfactory, click Next. Now we can finally begin the main calibration tests. Click Next to start it. If you set everything up correctly, you should now have a usable calibration. From here, click the Make Calibration button and enter notes for it if you wish. Now name the file anything you want and save it on your hard drive. The calibration only has to be done once, so save it somewhere safe for future use. After calibrating, we can move on to setting the microphone level for testing. Click the Levels button under Levels and Preferences. If you haven't hooked up your mic yet, now is the time to do it. Make sure that you point your test mic in an upright or pointing up position and that it's at your exact ear level listening position. When you're ready to set the levels, click Next. You should hear a low pitched noise coming from your speakers. This is normal. Make sure the output level is OK, but more importantly, adjust the gain on your mic preamp so that the input meter is reading somewhere between negative 12 and negative 24 decibels. Once your input level is fine, click Finish. Now we're ready to take our very first test. For demonstration purposes, we're going to be using both speakers, or monitors. There will come a time down the road that we'll want to use only one speaker at a time for testing, but for now, we'll just use both to get ourselves going. At the top left of Room EQ Wizard, click the Measure button. You can check your levels again by clicking the Check Levels button, but if everything is okay, we can go ahead and take the measurement. If you know you're testing only a particular range from the frequency spectrum, you can set the start and end frequencies here. Though you should probably just leave this alone, as we can always adjust what we're looking at later on. If you know the signal will be loud coming out of the monitors, this is the time to put in some earplugs. When you're ready, click Start Measuring. You should have heard a sine wave sweep throughout your selected sweep range, and a graph should now be appearing on your screen. It looks foreign, so this is where we can set it up for proper viewing. 
there is a function called octave smoothing in Rumi Key Wizard which can help you better see the big picture. You can access it by clicking Graph at the top and then selecting whichever octave smoothing preset that you'd like. We recommend to leave octave smoothing off completely for right now, so take it off by going back to the presets. Now we can start tweaking the viewing area, which will give us a more accurate view of what's going on in our room. The first thing to do is to click Limits at the top right. You can set this so you'll only view a selected frequency range. You can put 40 Hz for the left and 500 on the right and click Apply Settings, for example. We can also adjust the scale of the viewing area for both frequency range and decibel range. You can do this by clicking the magnifying glasses at the top left and at the bottom right. About 40 to 500 Hz is a good start for seeing the lower end. Note that I have only one test on the left side as you can see. We'll be doing some A-B testing in the future which will have multiple shots of your room. It'll look like this. You can select each one as you wish. Oftentimes, we'll need to overlay them to see the change in frequency response. You can do this by clicking Overlays at the top. At the bottom, check mark each test that you'd like to see appearing on the screen simultaneously. We've covered the basics of taking a measurement and viewing the frequency response of your room. Before we move on to generating a waterfall graph, here's a very brief explanation on decay times, waterfall graphs, and why they're so important to view, if not more important than frequency response. As a sound plays through your speakers, it doesn't just hit to you and stop, but continues to bounce around the room and slowly fades away over time. This is sometimes referred to by others as ringing or reverb. A waterfall graph allows you to visualize how quickly or slowly a given frequency decays over time. So to generate a waterfall, click the waterfall button at the top. Nothing appears on the screen. This is because we have to generate it first. You can generate it by clicking on the bottom left. Once it's generated, we need to set some limits. I'll take a look at the highest peak my test gave me. You can either click on the peak or hold down the left mouse button to see it more precisely. Blue text on the left will show you where the peak is. Remember this number and go into the limits settings. You want to set it up so you can have a usable view of decibel range. There is no correct way to do this, but we'll enter 100 for the top and 60 for the bottom, which will give us a usable 40 decibel range of our graph. For the left and right, enter 40 and 500. That's a good starting point. There's only one more thing to do before we're in the clear. Click Controls at the top right. Set the time range to 400 and set the window for 300. Now click Controls again. By changing those settings, it allows us to view it more realistically. From here, we're ready to change the limits and viewing ranges for both the frequency response graphs and the waterfall graphs. Just remember that the way I've shown you to set it up is only a starting point. As a final note, when sending your measurements to GIK or when posting on a forum, it's a good idea to not just post pictures of your graphs, but rather have the master test files. If you need to generate screenshots, make sure that the problem area you're trying to show is displaying on the screen. Use the range magnifying glasses to get it into clear view. Now click the Capture button at the top left, setting it up the way that you want to save it. Now click OK. Only the range you had in view is in the screenshot, so this makes it easier for someone to analyze. However, as mentioned, sending the master file, or better yet, both the master file and the quick screenshots, is usually always preferred. This way, the file can be opened by the person you've sent it to and can be analyzed in greater detail than solely a screenshot. You can save the master file by going to File and Save Measurements, if there's only one you'd like to send. Just be sure the one you want to save is selected on the left side. Or you can save all of your measurements in one single file by clicking File and Save All Measurements. Enter any notes you'd like, or skip it by clicking OK and then naming the file. Your test measurements are finally complete and saved. Now it's time to analyze it for yourself or send it off to someone else to be analyzed.